Right. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm going to, uh, to talk this morning about um, some of the preliminary results of the HTML uh, XML task force that uh, the TAG, the W3C TAG, set up uh, in an effort to explore the problems associated with some divergence between the HTML and XML family of markup specs, and uh, if that isn't a familiar topic to you, I will actually begin with uh, a little bit of history. So my plan is to talk a little bit about the history of how we got here and where we are, uh, and then explore a few use cases that the task force uh, talked about and uh, is proposing to publish a report on. I don't actually have any conclusions, so I'm going to end by uh, opening it up for some broader discussion and to ask your help to see if, uh, if we've actually managed to get, it, to get it right or close to right or failed miserably, or if you just want to throw things at me, whatever, whatever works for you. Well, I'm not speaking for the task force today. I'm not speaking for anybody. Um, I try. I occasionally irritate people by having opinions about uh, the way the world is and how I wish it was different than it is. I'll try not to do that. I'm going to try and present the facts. But uh, as an XML guy, uh, I will undoubtedly have a bias, and uh, I don't claim it to be anybody's but my own. How did we get here? Well, in the beginning, there was SGML. Actually, I suppose there were things before SGML, but. I don't really, yeah. Let's see. Uh, see. Yeah, yeah, fine. Fair enough. Um, oh. Now, those slides aren't supposed to be bigger than, than 1024 by 768. How disappointing. All right. Um, and from SGML, we got HTML, kind of. I mean, SG HTML was described in the spec, at least, as an SGML application. Uh, nobody actually implemented it that way. Uh, I bet I can get some hands to come up. Who here actually used an HTML parser to parse their HTML? And yes, I got about, about the hands I expected to get. Um, those of us, uh, uh, some of us did it that way, but uh, browsers certainly didn't implement it that way, and users didn't think about it that way, uh, and that wasn't the way uh, things really went. Now. From SGML, we also got XML. Uh, very definitely a direct connection there. You can parse XML documents with an SGML parser if you tinker with the SGML declaration in the appropriate way and close one eye and dance on your hands. And, um, and, and so uh, that was good. Uh, we, had, we had HTML and then we had XML. And the obvious next step to do was to combine the two to find an XML serialization for HTML, and from, from which we got XHTML. Uh, and that was good. Life was good. XHTML was good. Uh, we had browsers that could do some browsers that could do it, and some browsers that couldn't do it. But we, we had a direction. It all it all looked good. Uh, the next logical step was to define HTML5 on top of XHTML because that would have that would have eliminated a, a whole bunch of problems associated with invalid markup and made everything simpler and easier for everybody. And uh, I didn't bring my tinfoil hat, so I won't give you my cynical explanation for why the world didn't work that way. But um, That isn't actually how the world turned out. Uh, there's another alternate history. Uh, we could have taken XML and tweaked it a little bit and, and maybe made it a little more amenable to error correction and such, and we could have. I could continue talking, but is that better? OK, sorry. I... Sorry. I... Was told to put it on my shirt. Never mind. Um, so, so we could have we could have taken HTML and XML, and we could have tried to produce HTML5 on top of that by, by making some changes to XML and, and, and uh, perhaps making some changes to HTML. And maybe there was an opportunity for this to be the case at one point, uh, but I think we failed to uh, take advantage of that opportunity when it, when it arose, if, or failed perhaps even to notice that the opportunity had arisen. Uh, and so no, the world doesn't work like that either. Uh, <laughs> you see it blood. Good, Mohammed. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, not mine. Uh, uh, so what we have looks more like this. Um, the HTML community has, has gone off and made HTML5 as a descendant um, in sort of of HTML. They're, sort of, they're rewriting the parser. They're redoing the parsing algorithm. A lot of value there, a lot of benefit there. Having a consistent uh, parser algorithm for HTML will be a good thing. It will make life better. Um, there, will be an XHTML, there will be an XML serialization for HTML5, so you will be able to do um, XML parsing of some subset of, of HTML5 documents. 
Uh, and as a consequence of some of the discussion that arose over the task force, there has actually been some discussion about a micro XML, of simplifying XML a little bit, doing something. I don't know if anything's going to come of that, uh, so I put a question mark across there. Um, this is where we are today, and one can argue that this is problematic. Um, T.B. Raman, uh, I think now, um, sadly, several years ago, observed that this divergence was a problem and suggested something should be done about it. And time passed, and the glaciers came and went. And finally, we decided to do something about it. Um, it's been a long-standing issue for the TAG, the Technical Architecture Group, the W3C, uh, to look at this issue and at the technical plenary. November, I guess, of last year, or October, I forget now, um, Tim Berners-Lee decided to put together a task force for the TAG, and uh, for my sins, which must have been mighty, I agreed to chair it. Um, and, and the issue that we're looking at is this divergence, and that there are a number of ways in which you can look at the divergence and say it's a problem. Or, well, the divergence may be a problem. There are a number of things that are, in particular, issues. Um, the first is that HTML is really tag soup. I mean, browsers, HTML in the wild isn't actually well-formed markup very, very often. Uh, and that's a problem. Uh, it, it's not something you can feed to an XML parser with any, uh, any hope of getting anything useful out of it. Um, namespaces are complicated, and lots of people don't like them and wish they didn't exist, and, and so that's a problem. Uh, XML has certainly made, made that complicated for people. Tim loves to harp on the syntactic differences like coded attribute values. Uh, I can't actually bring myself to imagine that the fact that the quotes aren't there, don't have to be there in HTML is a serious problem, but, but um, apparently it is to some people. Uh, and then uh, I think the really the big ones are, are some DOM differences and, and some distributed extensibility problems. So I'm going to look at a couple of those in a little more detail. Uh, the DOM difference is the one that's sort of kind of the most scary. Here is an HTML5 document, I believe. Uh, it is certainly an XML document. Uh, and if you're familiar with XML, you can probably imagine what the DOM looks like for this. Um, no, no bonus points for figuring out what the DOM looks like for this document uh, if you send it to an XML parser. Uh, anybody think that the, you get a different DOM if you feed it to an HTML5 parser? At least one person said they do. Two people? Uh, yes, in fact, you do. Uh, in fact, if you look at a, the HTML5 parser's view of that document, you get a magical new T-body element inserted for you. And so even in a world where you have well-formed XML, XHTML documents, parsing with an HTML5 parser and parsing with an XML parser doesn't produce the same results, which strikes me as unfortunate. Um, Distributed extensibility is the other bugaboo. Um, it, has, it has a number of different uh, ramifications. Uh, sort of from a community, cultural sort of perspective, one of the problems is that uh, because the HTML5 working group has decided not to have any form of distributed extensibility, not to allow people to, uh, to make up new elements, um, the only way you can get things into HTML5 is by having the HTML5 working group agree that you, they will have something new and, and putting that in there for you. Uh, and, and that cuts in a number of different ways and depends on who you are and where you are. So uh, the three examples here, which I actually lifted these right out of um, Tim's uh, presentation at the, at the tech plenary. Um, the SVG work is in the W3C and it's in the HTML working group, so those two things are sort of going together fairly well. There are other, there are other activities that W3C that are not in the HTML working group, so the RDFA folks maybe feel uh, like they're not getting, not getting heard as well as they would like, um, even though they're in the same org. And then there's things like um, Facebook markup language, which I guess is being deprecated, which you might like to be able to integrate with HTML, but the folks doing that aren't even in the W3C, so they, they, um, they may feel even less involved. Uh, in practice, the, the whole namespace thing is, is uh, to some people, uh, a real problem. Um, the fact that the, dis the distributed extensibility story for XML relies on namespaces uh, makes some people think that it's a bad thing just because namespaces are evil. Um, not in that camp. I don't find anything wrong with namespaces, but hey. There has to be one weirdo in every group. Um, and finally, uh, there, there are folks that are, in principle, opposed to distributed extensibility for HTML. Their view is that um, the browser needs to be completely interoperable and it shouldn't be possible to construct a document that I could send to you in HTML that you wouldn't understand because it contains some new markup that you didn't recognize. Um, I can see that argument. Don't agree with that argument, but I can see that argument. Um, 
And so that is the background against which the task force was established. The folks on that slide are the folks who turned up for at least one or two phone calls and uh, there were other folks on the mailing list who participated as well. And we talked this through and, and given the sort of diversity of opinion and, and some difficulty in, in nailing down exactly what the problem we were trying to solve was, because uh, it's a fairly big, hairy sort of a thing and lots of people see it from lots of different perspectives and some people think some things are problems and some, things other, some other people think those are solutions. Um, we decided to start by trying to look at some use cases. And so uh, let's take a look at some of those use cases. The first is how do you consume HTML if you're an XML, you have an XML tool chain? Uh, and there are sort of two answers to this question. Uh, one is you can use what's called polyglot markup. There's a, there's a spec for it at W3C, and you can sort of imagine what it is. It, it's the subset of HTML5 that also happens to be well-formed XML. The example I gave earlier, I believe, is a polyglot document. Uh, it's one that an HTML parser will, will accept and won't think has any errors in it, and it's also one that an XML parser will accept and won't think there are any errors in it. Um, not an absolutely perfect solution, even if, even if you had enough control over your authoring environment to guarantee that everybody would actually author that way, in which case <coughs> you could just do it in XML. Um, the, the, the fact that the HTML5 parser and the XML parser are going to give different results for some documents, different DOM trees for some documents, uh, could still be problematic. So the easiest thing to do is probably stick an HTML5 parser in front of your tool chain. And I don't actually think that's a completely unreasonable answer. If you're going to be doing something with HTML, with HTML that you find in the wild, it isn't going to be well-formed, it isn't going to be polyglot. The huge benefit, or one of the huge benefits that the, that the HTML5 work is, is bringing to the world is complete uniformity in what a random sequence of octets produces in terms of a data model. Um, so you might as well take advantage of that, stick an HTML parser in the front, uh, and produce a DOM that way, and, uh, and, then, and then build on top of that. Um, it doesn't solve the pernicious problem of documents that modify themselves as they're being loaded, but dear Lord, what are you going to do with those documents anyway in any environment other than a browser? So um, short of running a JavaScript engine, you're probably not going to be able to deal with the scripting issues, but um, I think that the issues, the documents that contain script that you might want to process with other tools may be a, a smaller subset than, than HTML in, at large, although these days that's not absolutely clear. The logical converse of that question is, how do you consume XML if you have an HTML5 tool chain? Now, this is a slightly speculative question. Uh, it's sort of the logical opposite, but um, one imagines in the future that HTML5 will be wildly successful and people will develop tools which expect to process HTML. Uh, a, a page layout engine that, uh, that only accepts HTML or some, you know, the CS, some CSS widgety thing that, that, does, that does page layout or something with, uh, with HTML. And you've got a bag of XML and you think that's a cool tool and you like the output it produces or your publication department says thou shalt use this tool and, and you want to do that. Um, how are you going to get that, that tool to accept your XML? Uh, and and uh, it's, you're probably not going to is, is the real answer. The, the HTML parser is going to interpret markup that it doesn't understand as error and correct for it. So your XML, it's got arbitrary element names and it isn't going to, uh, isn't going to go through. You're likely your best bet is to find some way to down-translate the XML that you want to process into HTML. Uh, or at the very least, strip out the things that are obviously going to trip up the HTML parser, trip, take the, H, the, uh, the namespaces out, uh, take the PIs out. I didn't realize that until I was, we were halfway through this that this apparently implies that HTML doesn't have PIs, but never mind. Um, uh, the answer at the end is it's probably not best, best not to encourage people to imagine that they're going to be able to feed arbitrary XML to an HTML tool chain and get useful information out. Kind of unfortunate, but there you go. Uh, the next question is you've got some XML documents and you'd like to embed some HTML in them. This is a fairly common occurrence. You've got a, a schema language or some other non-documenty form of XML, but you've got some slots in there where you can stick in some, some prose markup, some descriptive markup. Uh, and, and you can put any vocabulary you want in there, but one very common vocabulary to put in is HTML because then when you want to render that to the browser to show somebody your schema, it's sort of you take that bag of bits and stuff it into the browser and it just works. You don't have to do any translation. Um, so 
there are two sort of ways you can do that. Um, you can use the XML serialization of HTML5, in which case you're done. You're, you have an XML tool, you're building an XML schema, you're prepared to deal with XML, you're not worried about, about uh, well formedness errors, you're, you're comfortable fixing those. So you can just use the XML serialization and, and, uh, and embed it uh, the way you'd like. Uh, the other alternative is to escape the markup, and this is exactly the same way it works today. RSS feeds that have HTML in them escape all the angle brackets and uh, allow people to put in any sort of random sequence of bytes they'd like, and, uh, and the browser does what it does with it, and, and people seem happy with that. Uh, a third alternative uh, that was observed is that you can rely on multi-part messaging, and uh, there are specs in the SOAP space for doing this that I've never understood, uh, but you, you, could, uh, you could put them together that way. I think using XML serialization or, or escaping the markup are, are by far the more popular answers. Um, so that, that's an opportunity for you to embed it, HTML in XML. Uh, it's worth noting that uh, there's still some things to think about in, in terms of how that gets rendered later on. Do you, do you take the DOM and hand the whole DOM to the browser, in which case, in theory, there are namespaces in scope, or do you just clip out the HTML bits and render them, which, which has other problems, but um, entirely tractable. The, uh, the logical converse of that question is, how do you embed XML in an HTML document? Uh, and for me personally, this is the one with the sort of most disappointing answer, uh, in that it has an answer so people don't want to work on the problem anymore, but the answer is very disappointing. Um, the, as I said earlier, if you feed random markup to an HTML5 parser, it says, oh, this is, this is user error, I'll fix it. Uh, and that correction can include not only stripping out namespaces, but also um, changing the order and, and nesting of tags. So you have some random blob of XML in the middle of an HTML document. If there happens to be an element with the local name A in there in the middle, the HTML5 parser says, oh, this is an anchor. Everything I've seen so far must have been wrong. We'll close everything that's open and then use the anchor. And then, oh, there's an end tag. I didn't expect that. Well, we'll throw that on the floor. And, um, and this is, I mean, this is a, 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 a algorithm carefully developed by the folks in the HTML working group to deal with markup in the wild, to display in the browser the way uh, legacy browsers display it. It's not um, not invented out of mean spiritedness. It's just uh, it's just an unfortunate consequence of trying to deal with a vast quantity of legacy. And that means you can't sort of stick naked islands of XML in HTML documents. It just doesn't work. <laughs> Thank you. That's the joke I wanted you to make. Um, yes, you can put clothes on them. Um, you can embed them in, in, in your HTML documents if you stick them in script elements. Now, uh, script is, a, there are historical reasons why. <laughs> Uh, there are historical reasons why the element has to be named script. It's because that's the only element or one of a very small number of elements. Uh, it's the only practical element that the legacy HTML browsers will look at and go, oh, I'm not supposed to render that, and so they'll leave it alone. Um, you can put a type on there, so you can say script type equals application XML. And, uh, uh, you know, it kind of, uh, all right, so, so you, now you can sort of stick your arbitrary XML in there and at runtime you can have some JavaScript uh, that will go find those things and, well, what does it have to do with them? Uh, unfortunately, what it has to do with them is parse them. Because the content of the script element, whether you escape it or not, is always text characters. So all those angle brackets that you thought were markup in the script element aren't markup in the script element as far as HTML5 is concerned. It will happily treat those as regular old angle bracket characters and stick them in there. So what does your, your JavaScript shim have to do? It has to find the script elements that are type application XML, extract their text content, run them through some JavaScript XML parser thingamajig thingy that you've got handy, and I guess the browsers provide you with such a widget, uh, and then now you've got a bag of XML and now you inject it back into the DOM or do whatever you want with it. The fact that it works at all is kind of remarkable, but it's very disappointing uh, in terms of, of how it works. And I think um, it's worth considering just not doing it. I mean, this is, it wouldn't be fair to, to not point this solution out. Those of us who wish that HTML had adopted some sort of distributed extensibility mechanism um, have to be careful not to assert that HTML has no extensibility mechanisms. It has several extensibility mechanisms. 
Uh, and and uh, one of them is to use class attributes on existing HTML elements. And, uh, and there's actually these data elements. And there was a whole microdata thing going on for a while. But as far as I can tell, the microdata thing is stalled or fallen off the edge of the world or something. Uh, and so here's the sort of the same information, more or less, uh, in a format that the HTML parser will do the right thing with. Um, sad but true. Um, so as I say, the thing that disappoints me most about this is that there's kind of an answer, so there's a sense in which um, some folks look at this and say, yeah, there's no problem because we have an answer, but the answer is awfully disappointing. So. Um, In the spirit of not seeming one-sided, um, it was important to look at, at some of the things that, that we might do to XML. Uh, and I think we might you know, someday want to consider doing some of these things. Um, uh, it's, you, it, it has been observed that if you produce XML the way a lot of HTML is produced, which is print statements in some procedural programming language, it's really easy to get it wrong. It's easy to leave a quote off or fail to get some Unicode character escaped just right or end the wrong element or something. Uh, and, so, and so naive attempts to do this frequently produce uh, XML that's not well formed and the XML parser is remarkably unforgiving of this and, and so you have problems when you try and consume it later. It's clear that the, the XML community could decide to do something about this. We could, we could have markup minimization. We could have... <laughs> Man, Shannon just killed me. <laughs> that, that look was fatal. <laughs> um, uh, uh, we could have markup minimization. <laughs> we could we could have rules for doing error correction. Um, you know, those are things that, that could be done. Um, um, I'm not sure that there's uh, that there's um, motivation to do that. Uh, another use case that came along, and I, I know it's, it's one that um, I put in here for this presentation in particular because I think it will generate some, some discussion. Um, the task force tried to look at the XForms use case. And we weren't able to, uh, to construct a, a cogent description of the use case that, that satisfied everybody uh, in the meeting. Um, some folks asserted that, that XForms wasn't the use case, it was a solution for a use case, and the use case was, was more powerful forms. Uh, and other folks um, couldn't see how XForms was different than the general embedding XML and HTML problem. Uh, I, so it sputtered along for a little while, and then finally it just sort of it went dormant because um, I, couldn't ha I didn't have good answers for those questions. So folks who have good answers for those questions, I would certainly be interested in resurrecting that use case. Um, so what can you do? How am I doing on time? Have I done this all in five minutes, or have I taken all of the time? Yeah, not bad. Um, so, so uh, you, things you, that I'd like you to do in, 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 uh, in, in lieu of having any sorts of conclusions. Um, one is there's a task force report. The URL is, if you clicked on that link, you could see it, but it's also printed on the next page. Um, and I'd like, you know, so review that, take a look at that, talk to the communities that you know and see what use cases they have. I, it, it seems very strange to me that we tried to come up with use cases and came up with like eight. I would have thought there were going to be 80, but... Uh, I'm concerned that we may have overlooked some. I'm concerned that there may be large organizations with lots of requirements that we just totally failed to see. So please, uh, please report any use cases you think that, uh, that we didn't, didn't meet. Um, I find this all very depressing by, by halves. And um, I, think, I think that it behooves us to realize that, um, that the future is longer than the past. And the fact that we don't like where we are today doesn't mean that we can't ever get to a better place some, sometime in the future. Uh, and so I think uh, even, if, even if we're not happy now, it, uh, it is worth thinking about what we might do to, uh, to improve things in the future. Uh, right, so. There's a link to the mailing list, which I encourage you to join and, and contribute to, to, the, uh, to the workings of the task force. And um, a editor's draft uh, of the report um, that I managed to get done before the conference, yay me, uh, is up there. And that's, I, I'm perfectly happy to have some discussion. That's all I've got to say. I believe, I believe Mohammed has brought a box of rocks. He will now pass them out. Yeah. <laughs> so any questions? Oh, yeah. Henry. So, sorry. Henry Thompson, University of Edinburgh. Um, it seems to me the crucial, well, a crucial constituency, which is well represented in this room, 
is people who have extensive XML-based tool chains for web publishing, right? Tool chains that end with XHTML. Um, we all know customers, we all know people, I, there are people in this room who make their living from this, right? How bad is life going to be for them in the new world? Uh, it's not an easy question to answer. I mean, what, if you're producing XHTML today, continue to produce XHTML. My God, IE supports it now. Shades of the 21st century. Um, so, so there's no actual reason why you can't continue to produce XHTML if that's what you're comfortable producing. And if you're producing just, you know, if your view of HTML is that it's, you know, PDF for the web, it's just an output format, then you can generate HTML5 as easily as you can generate anything else, and that will sort of be okay, I think. I mean. I think it makes sense for, for tools like the, the uh, serialization spec in, in the uh, query and XSL specs to consider having an HTML5 output method so that the serialization just comes out exactly right for free. Um, but but that, that I think will be okay. Somebody else had a question farther back? You knew you were going to get one from me. So oh. introduce yourself, Alex. I'm Alex Malowski. I guess I'm also at the University of Edinburgh. Um, so I guess as you were talking, I realized that do, doesn't HTML5 also have a forwards compatible parsing problem? If, if you can't introduce new markup, they also can't introduce new markup without getting the DOM wrong in the current HTML5 implementation. So they do HTML6, and the old browsers will get the DOM wrong. Uh, I'm not fully qualified to answer that question, but I think the answer is they're going to be very, very careful. They're, they're not going to introduce new elements where the, the default, the, the fallback behavior browsers have for a random new element foo is we show you the content of foo and not the tag. So as long as they're willing to live within those constraints, they can introduce any markup they want. Uh, yeah, I don't, I, don't, I don't know. Looks like a problem to me too, but um, I think not having distributed accessibility is a problem, and they don't, so. Okay. Can you hear me? Anybody else? Yep. Can you hear me? Uh, oh, I'm here. Somebody. Uh, <laughs> okay. oh, but you uh, only so have a mic already. Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good. Uh, so I'm sort of pro XML as well, obviously. But uh, there were some valid. Uh, I'm I'm Lech, by the way, Lech uh, So there there are some valid arguments behind decisions that were made for HTML5. Like uh, you know, some many many people are struggling with namespaces, so you sort of skipped over the the, the micro XML and simplification of XML. Can you maybe maybe talk a bit more about this? What can be done with XML to sort of address the issues that maybe less technical people have with XML? Um, I, I, it's an interesting question. So so um, the. The, one of the proposals is to move all, you know, move all the namespace declarations to the top uh, is one thing, so that you don't have to worry about namespace declarations stuck in the middle. To uh, I forgot, I'm trying to remember now what some of the other things were. There, there, there was the James Clark did a, a spec for it, and John Cowan has implemented a parser for it. Um, I, I think if the community wants to try and simplify XML, that's an effort that would require, you know time to decide what the actual requirements were so that we could, uh, so that we could get it right. Um, I, I, the chances I, that, that, that the result would interest the HTML5 community are measurable but very small. Yeah, I, I, especially if we start today, right? I mean, the, 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 one, of the, one, of the things that, the, one of the things that motivated this slide um, is that working groups have uh, a lifespan. They have, they have periods where they're doing new work and they have periods where they're trying to get done. And an HTML5 working group, like any other working group, wants to be done. They want to get the last call. They want to close all their open issues. And I've been there, man. I know that feeling. I have, I have absolutely, absolute sympathy for, for wanting to do that. So um, you know, the fact that simplifying XML wouldn't help at all for HTML5, as, as Henry observes, doesn't mean that it wouldn't be a, wouldn't be a foundation for some future work that would that would improve it. So I think you know it might even be worth looking at, even if we don't think it will have immediate benefits. But the XML community has tools that work with these things. We're used to working with them. They have benefits that we've all taken advantage of. So it's hard to it's hard to um, hard to see the groundswell of support for simplifying XML inside the XML community. And I don't know, it's a problem. Any other questions? Liam, you had your hand up. Did you want to say something? Oh, yeah, yes. Could somebody find you a microphone? Oh, wait. Yeah. 
Yeah. Can you hear me? I can. Uh, Liam Quinn, XML Activity Lead at W3C. Uh, in principle, if we were going to change XML, and I don't mean making a profile like micro XML is currently pre presented, but changing XML, for example, to do uh, to allow you to leave the quotes off attribute values and make at least one person happy, then in principle we could change XML to add HTML5 sections, for example, like C data sections, but with the appropriately changed syntax so that you can embed HTML5 lumps in there. If we were about to change XML in, that, in an incompatible way, we're not about to change XML in an incompatible way, though. <laughs> no, there, are, there are currently no plans at W3C to do that. I can, future is long, but right now there are no plans. But if there were, we could. That's not a, it's not a question, it's a statement. <laughs> Anybody else? Were you? Oh. And I would never go over again. <laughs> Okay, so no other questions? I have only one for you, is why did you accept to be the chair of this working group? Uh, because, uh, because, because I didn't want to Thank be you for the answer. I didn't want to be in the... Uh, I, 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 have an answer. I have an answer. I did not, I did not want to be in the position in a few years of saying, oh my God, it's a mess. Why didn't I try and help? So I'm trying to help. I may not succeed, but I'm at least trying to help. Anyway, thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. So now we will have, uh, we have a few minutes in advance to, to have the next talk. The next talk is...